from the day of Pentecost to now, biblical preaching has been the backbone of the church. Peter's first sermon delivered at Pentecost was biblically based, had several references to the text from the Old Testament which Peter used to prove that Jesus was the Messiah and the people listening needed to believe in him. And as a result of that sermon delivered that day, um, 3,000 people came to accept Jesus Christ and it formed the basis of the New Testament church. And every great awakening that swept America or Europe has had its base. The prayers of the people of God and strong biblical preaching. It was biblical preaching which the early church fathers used to win many souls to Christ in the Roman Empire. As the, the gospel spread and Saul and Paul or, and Timothy and others began to spread throughout the known world, it was Roman, the Roman Empire which heard the gospel preached through these men. It was the preaching of the great reformers as the world was coming, particularly England and Europe, as it was coming out of the Dark Ages, and they began to preach the gospel. Martin Luther, John Knox, Ulrich Zwingli, John Calvin, many others who helped bring the light of Christ to Europe in the 1500s as they exited the Dark Ages and entered a time of enlightenment. It was John Bunyan and others who led the Puritan revivals in England during the 1600s. It was John Wesley, George Whitefield, Jonathan Edwards, and others who preached strong biblical sermons which were instrumental in bringing about the Great Awakening of the 1700s. The preaching of these men brought about one of the greatest revivals that the world has ever seen. Throughout England and the United States, literally thousands upon thousands of people came to Christ because of godly men preaching biblically based sermons. In our own generation, we have Billy Graham and Billy Sunday and others who had impacts on had, had an impact on the world through strong biblical preaching. But today, as we look at our world, I think it would be correct to say that solid biblical preaching has been set aside by many who fill the pulpits of the churches in the world today. We Find in Europe, which used to be a stronghold of solid biblical preaching, that has become a desert of all things biblical. Many preachers in the United States and Europe are more interested in making the people happy and drawing large numbers than they are in presenting the truth contained in the Word of God, presenting this Word unadulterated and without any um, embellishment. We find people today who are preaching out of their own books that they write or out of their own ideology and it doesn't match up to scripture. But we find many in this, this world who are changing the text to fit what the people want to hear today. And that is not strong biblical preaching. In fact, it would be what Amos chapter 11, 8 verse 11 says when he proclaimed to the nation of Israel, hear this, the days are coming. This is the declaration of the Lord. But I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, indicating that people would not hear the word because the word would not be preached. And as in the day that followed the days of Amos, that day has returned and there is a lack of strong biblical preaching. That day is today. And despite the absence of strong biblical preaching in many of the churches throughout our world, the fact is that the Word of God is still advancing because it is the Word of God. Just because God's people or those who claim to be God's people don't preach the Word does not mean that the Word will not go forth, that the Word will not find hearts and people who are, are to be in touch by it because the Holy Spirit is at work in this world using the Word of God to change the hearts and minds of men and women and children throughout this world. Regardless of what happens in the pulpit, God is not going to let His Word go away. He is going to use it in this world for His own glory. He gave it so that man, men, women, and children everywhere might be able to read it, understand it, realize they need a Savior, and cry out to Christ for salvation. Despite this absence of strong biblical preaching, 
God is upholding the authority of his own word. The New Testament repeatedly points out the importance of strong biblical preaching. And we find Paul in Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 14, as he preaches the first of his recorded sermons. Um, he's already preached before this. We know that. The Bible is mentioned in Acts. Uh, but this is the first in which we find it written out and recorded as to what he wrote. So if you'll turn to Acts chapter 13, verse 14 and following, we're going to look at the first recorded sermon and find that it is very much biblically based. So Acts chapter 13, verse 14, as you find it, stand with us. And they continued their journey from Perga and reached the city in Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, you can speak. Paul stood up and motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our ancestors made the people prosper during their stay in the land of Egypt, and led them out of it with a mighty arm. And for about 40 years he put up with them in the wilderness, and after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. And this all took about 450 years. And after this he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them the... Saul, the son of, of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And after removing him, he raised up David as their king and testified about him. I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart, who will carry out my will. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word this morning. And as we examine it, we just ask that you speak to our heart, for you are God, and this is your word. And we want to be open to the word so that we might obey it and walk in it. And we ask that in the very name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. So what we find here is Paul lays his sermon out in three different points. Um, nowhere in here, though, does he put a point so he doesn't know about the local thing. You know, three points and a point, as a lot of preachers today seem to do. But what we do find is that Paul, as he preaches, is going to be incredibly biblically based. He will make reference to the Old Testament, which is his Bible at that time, and he will use it as a basis to introduce these people of Antioch to the name of Jesus Christ and why they should receive him. So last week we noted that as uh, they finished preaching on the island of Cyprus, that Paul and Barnabas and John Mark at the time left Cyprus, landed in Perga, and once they landed in Perga, John Mark left them, and he headed back to Jerusalem. He was the cousin of Barnabas. I'm sure Barnabas said, yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, this is going to cause a, a rift between Paul and Barnabas later. But for now, it seems to be okay. And, and instead of preaching in Perga, though, they immediately head north, led by the Holy Spirit, to the city in Antioch. This trip is about 100 miles from Perga to Antioch, and Antioch was up in the mountains in some very rough territory, very dangerous territory. Those mountains had bandits and rebels who even Alexander the Great could not unseat while they were there. He could not get rid of them, and they still were there to this day, and they would attack caravans and travelers, sometimes killing them, other times capturing them and sending them for a ransom. Um, so it was a dangerous trip for them to make and as they arrive, they, they, they find lodging, they do the normal things you would expect. And then on the day of the, of the Sabbath, which was Saturday, they went to the synagogue. And as they went to the synagogue, Paul went fully expecting to be asked to preach. He was fully expecting to be able to stand before these Jews in the city in Antioch and, and deliver a message to them because it was common practice to ask Visitors, especially men of import, as Paul, who was known to be a, a, a protege of a man by the name of Gamaliel, he, he would be asked to speak, and so he had prepared something to say. And as he indeed, as we see there in verse 15, uh, as they say, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, you can 
speak. And then verse 16 says, Paul stood up and motioned with his hand. And he began to speak. And he knew his audience. He understood that Jewish people and those who were God-fearers liked to be reminded of their past and told that God could do what he had done then, now. Particularly in the area of defeating their enemies. They, they really wanted the Romans to be defeated. So here, Paul is going to start off with some of the history. And all of the history that he starts off with is biblically based. It's all right there in the Old Testament. Everything he's going to touch on is straight out of um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. All of that is in there. He, he reaches back in his knowledge and through the Holy Spirit is going to deliver a message that touches the hearts of these who are listening. So in verse 17, he starts by beginning reciting this history of the Jews. And he says, the God of this people, Israel, chose our ancestors. And that's an indication of uh, a mention of basically Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, and the, the forefathers as they began to formulate a nation before they went into Egypt. Then he continues with talking about going to Egypt, being there for 400 years, and how God made them great while they were in Egypt. And then he speaks about how the Exodus came about with a mighty arm of God speaking towards the, those different plagues there, those plagues that just swept through Egypt late, and they couldn't stand against God. Um, all of these things are encouraging to the people who are listening. And Paul mentions the, the 40 years of wandering, which is indicative of their disobedience. And, and the Jews were honest about that. That was the case. Our forefathers would, would disobey, and many, a whole generation would die in the desert. And then he continues about how God destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan and handed those, that land over to the Israelites as an inheritance from God. Then in quick succession, Paul touches on the time of the judges, the time of Samuel, who was both judge and prophet, the bridge between the judges and the time of the kings. And then he mentions the kings, and he mentions two specifically. We see there in verse 21, he mentions Saul, the son of Kish, who was a Benjamite, who reigned for 40 years. And the implication, though, um, he doesn't explain why, like he says in verse 22, after removing him, he doesn't say what and how and why he removed him, but they knew the history. They knew that Saul had messed up. They knew that Saul had pursued some things that he shouldn't have pursued. And then David was raised up, the king, the one that they looked back on all the time and said, let's compare this king to King David. Let's compare these events to the time of King David because King David was their king that they compared everything to. And they, they knew that the Messiah was supposed to come through the line of King David. They knew that the Messiah was supposed to come from this line and so that he would be raised up and somehow be tied to King David. Now we might ask ourselves, why would Paul go through all of this? Why would he touch on the history in such a manner? Well, obviously, he's, he's laying a foundation of some sort so that he might present Jesus Christ. You know, throughout man's history, questions such as why am I here and why do we exist have been asked. And man, even to this day, struggles with the understanding of, of their existence. Many commit suicide because they don't even know why they exist and they can't fathom anything more than what they have right now. They don't grasp the significance of history. That all of history exists and that they, you and I, and they exist for the purpose of knowing Jesus Christ. That is our purpose. And the foundation has been laid in Scripture so that all humans can know Jesus Christ. Old Testament, New Testament, we have the foundation that is laid so that the history of the world has been presented forth so that we might know Jesus Christ. Paul understands this, and he is laying this foundation, this culmination of Jewish history, because he wants them here in Antioch, the city, to know about 
Jesus Christ. Paul then moves on to the fulfillment of prophecy in verses 23 through 37. Um, he talks about verse 23, from this man's descendants, talking about David, as he promised, God brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus. This is the only place he's even going to really mention the name of Christ, Jesus. And the implication is, here we have David, we know about lineages, and David had a son, a great, grand, great, 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 down the line, grandson named Jesus, who is the Savior that we call the Messiah. And that they're not unfamiliar with the name of Jesus. Jesus' name has shaken the world. They are fully understanding of some of the events going on down in Jerusalem. Uh, they even know about John the Baptist who will be brought up in verse 24. These people who are there in the city of Antioch, they're, they're not ignorant of the events of the day. And as they have asked Paul to speak, it should come as no surprise that he is going to bring up the name of Jesus. For many of them probably even realize that he has become a proponent of this Messiah. So, when we look at... <coughs> Our Old Testament today, and we see all of these prophecies that, they, uh, that Paul is about to touch on. And you may not know it, but many in our world today are very skeptic uh, of these prophecies. There are many in our world who say that people went back and added words to these prophets, to Amos and Isaiah and Daniel, and that, that they added words after the fact. And that the Jews changed it so that it would fit the Messiah and the revelations thereof or the history that was revealed. And we, we know that's a bunch of bunk and it's not true. But nonetheless, it is still out there. These, these same skeptics today, they're, they're, they've been in the world for a long time, but we have ours today who still don't believe in Jesus. They would rather say that the miracles didn't happen, that the events of the life of Christ have been changed, that Man has handpicked certain books to go into the Bible instead of being led by God, and so on and so forth. And skeptics are still there. But when Paul is presenting this, he's not aware if they're skeptical or not. But what he knows is that historically, Jesus is tied in with David. And prophetically, Jesus is tied in with David. Messiah would come from the line of David. Jesus was from the line of David. While that doesn't immediately mean that Jesus is the Messiah, Paul is now going to go through and use Scripture to point out how that is the case. And he will mention, as we see here in verses 24 and 25, the fulfillment of Isaiah 40 verses 30 through 5 and Malachi 3 1 as he speaks of John the Baptist being the one who preceded Jesus. He, taught, he says, um, the baptism of repentance to all of Israel. And then he uses John's name in verse 25. And now as John was completing his mission, he said, who do you think I am? I am not the one. But one is coming after me, and I am not worthy to untie the sandals on his feet. And they would have known that John had pointed out Jesus as the Messiah. And they probably would have even known that before he died, John had sent a message to Jesus asking, Are you the Messiah? And Jesus responded with the events that were going on in the day as proof of his claim of Messiahship. Most of these guys at this point are probably enthralled by what Paul is saying. Paul is preaching and they are they are, they are grasped by the significance. There is something in the air that is moving called the Holy Spirit. And they sense that God is moving. So Paul continues in, in verse 27. And he points out to them the rejection of, the, of Jesus by, by the people of Israel. So since the residents of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize him. Are the sayings of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. They fulfilled their words by condemning him. 
Oftentimes the question is asked, how, how did Israel, the people of Israel, miss Jesus? How did they, the leaders not see that Jesus was the Messiah? Well, they had to reject him in order to fulfill the prophecy that was spoken about him. In Isaiah 53, 2, it, it is declared the Messiah would be despised and forsaken by men. The, the demand of Pilate, uh, their demand of Pilate for the death of Jesus fulfilled Psalm 69, 4, which says, Those who hate me without cause are more than the hairs of my head. So Paul points out that Jesus would be despised by his own people and that Jesus would eventually even be crucified, which is very unlikely in the Old Testament that that was even going to be written about because during that day and age, while crucifixion was scattered here and there throughout the world, the people of, of Israel very likely had either not heard of crucifixion or had never practiced it. And it was not a common form of punishment. It would not be something that would immediately enter the, the head of someone to write about unless it is placed there by God. And indeed, that is exactly what happened. So Paul mentions the crucifixion there. He talks about since the rest of this, verse 28. Though they found no grounds from death for the descendants, they asked Pilate to have him killed. Pilate being a Roman, they would know that it would be crucifixion, those who were sitting there. And when they had carried out all that had been written about him, they took him down from the tree, meaning the cross, and they put him in the tomb. And in this crucifixion, we see many of the Old Testament uh, prophecies come to pass. Psalms 109, 25 says, I have become an object of ridicule to my accusers. When they see me, they shake their head and scorn. And in fact, the New Testament doesn't record that they would come through and shake their head. Psalm 22, 17 and 18, I can count all my bones. People look at and stare at me. They divided my garments among them, and they cast lots for my clothing. And we see that with fulfillment of the Roman soldiers who cast lots for his clothing. Psalm 69, 21, instead, they gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And we know that when he cried out, I'm thirsty, that's what they did. They gave him a gall, a vinegar to drink. <clears throat> Zechariah 12, 10 says, I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David, the residents of, Israel, of Jerusalem, and they will look at me, whom they pierced, indicating the spirit that went into the side of Christ where blood and water flowed. Even Jesus' cry of agony on the cross, when the sins of the world were placed upon him, is recorded in Psalms 22.1, where it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Paul mentions the grave here. Oftentimes in the Roman era, someone who is crucified is taken down. They're not afforded a decent burial. They are tossed in the dung heap. They are thrown into a common grave with other people, generally upon a fire which burns and destroys the body so that those who love the person cannot come and get the person. And yet we know that when Jesus died... Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to Pilate and asked for the body, and it was indeed given to him. And Isaiah 53, 9 speaks to this. It says his grave was assigned with the wicked, which is what he was supposed to be. He was supposed to be thrown in with the wicked, but yet he was with a rich man in his death, speaking of the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, where Jesus was laid to rest for three days when he borrowed it. Because on that third day, he would leave. In verse 30, Paul reaches the climax of his sermon. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is proof that he was a long-awaited Messiah. Look at verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. Amen. One of the best scriptures. One of the most exciting things that you and I can be reminded of is that while Christ did indeed die on the cross, while he was indeed laid in a tomb on the third day, God raised him from the dead. He has conquered sin and he has conquered 
death. Paul will go on there and say, but and he appeared for many days to those who came with up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we ourselves proclaim to you the good news of the promise that was made to our ancestors. What Paul is saying is that not only was Jesus raised from the dead, but he was seen by many. And in fact, over in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, it mentions more than 500 people were witnesses to the resurrected Christ. And that many of them were still alive. Though some were asleep, they were still out there preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostles were some of these. 1 Corinthians 15, 8, Paul claims himself to have been a witness to the resurrected Christ. And these folks who had seen the resurrected Christ can give testimony to his resurrection. Not just believe what I'm saying, they say, but go and hear the testimony of those who saw and were a party of the resurrection. Paul will conclude his segment on prophecy in verses 32 through 37 by mentioning three promises fulfilled in Christ. First, Paul quotes Psalms 2 7 there in verse 33 which predicted the incarnation of Jesus, in which Paul sees as a prediction of the resurrection as well, because the resurrection brought glory and magnified Christ's position as the Son of God. It says, You are my Son, verse 33, You are my Son, today I become your Father. Not saying that He wasn't the Father before, but that with the resurrection and with the events that had preceded it, Christ has conquered those things that he was supposed to conquer. And now he has brought honor and glory and has magnified his position as Messiah. The second promise is mentioned there in verses 34 through 36. When he says, I will give you the holy and sure promises of David. In verse 35, you will not let your holy one see decay. Psalm 16.10 is the one which is being quoted there second. For you will not abandon me to Sheol. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. And Paul states that David died and remained in the grave. So these words could not have been spoken about David. They were not meant for David. They were meant for the one who would die one day and come back out of the grave. And Jesus was that person. He was the one who died. He was the one who was laid in the grave. And he came out of the grave. And so we see these three promises that are spoken of. We see that they are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Those who are listening, Paul's audience, know about these things. They're not ignorant men. And as he speaks to them, he is making a very clear and definitive and very plain cause that Jesus is the Messiah and that they need to believe in him. In verses 38 through 41, he makes that extremely clear that Jesus is the justifier of sinners. Look at those last few verses there, 38 through 41. It says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. So beware that what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away because I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe even if someone were to explain it to you. So here we have Paul ending his sermon with a plea, a, a cry, a desperation that these who are listening will come and understand that they are sinners and that they need to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He, he mentions here that they are in need of salvation. And we find that what he writes here follows Romans 3.23 where it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every man there would have declared this was the truth. Every person present would have said, yes, this is the case, that all men have fallen short of the glory of God. In fact, 1 Kings 8, 46, Solomon spoke these same words, basically, when he said, there is no man who does not sin. Sin was not the question. 
Every man sinned. Those who were present as Paul was speaking understood that they were sinners. And that they had been working through the law in order to expiate, to get rid of their sin, to try to, to, to overcome their sin, to try to meet what God has said. And Paul is clear there that the law of Moses could not justify them. That that is not what justified anyone. The following of the law of Moses, the following of all those laws the Pharisees has written, this is not what was successful. It was man's heart before God crying out for mercy, even as he brought his sacrifice, and that sacrifice was slain on the altar and the blood was shed. It was the heart of man as he cried out that, that changed before God. But they still had to come the next year and make another sacrifice. And then the next year make another sacrifice because it wasn't good enough. And now Jesus Christ had died on the cross of Calvary. His blood had been shed. The sins of the world had been placed on Him. And through faith in Him, they could be fully, completely justified. That which they sought, that which they earnestly desired, the forgiveness of sins for all time could be made, could be had through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 39 again, he makes it very clear. Everyone who believes is justified through him. Everyone. Man, woman, child, if they come to Christ and they, they seek salvation, they get what they ask for. <coughs> Habakkuk 1.5 is the quote there. Look, you scoffers, and marvel and vanish away because I'm doing a work in your days. That's that quote. And he says, don't make the mistake that those who heard Habakkuk preach made. Rejecting Christ brings about judgment and eternal damnation in hell. And he's telling them, this is not what you want. That the field has been changed. The sacrifices no longer mean anything. The final sacrifice has been made. And if you continue to try to follow the law, you will find yourself dying and going to hell. But if you find that you, you believe in Jesus Christ and you give your heart to Him, you will find that you will die and go to heaven. And that message still rings true today. Eight billion people in our world are close to it. And all of these people are seeking the meaning of life and the reason for their existence. Many would agree with the French existential philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, who wrote, while you live, nothing happens. The scenery changes. People come in and go out. That's all. There are no beginnings. Days add on to days without rhyme or reason. And interminable and monotonous Addition. Basically, there's no reason for life. We just exist. John Paul Sarté, I'm not sure how you say his name, Sarté would say. And that's just not true. The idea that life doesn't have purpose or an end with a judgment in our world today is one that is popular because if there is no judgment, if there's no result, um, so no God in heaven who's going to set in judgment over us, that means everything's available, doesn't it? It means that we can do what we want, go where we want, hurt who we want, and there will be no one to hold us accountable. And our world seems to have taken that to heart. Today our world does what it wants. It goes where it wants. It says what it wants. It is evil in many things. And if you just look at our world, there's no way you can't see the advancement of evil in our world. The rise of pedophilia and other incredibly harmful behaviors in our society which are being mainstreamed is damaging and horrible. In the novel by Dostoevsky called The Brothers Kalamazov, one of the characters in it says this, if there is no God, then everything is permitted. And while many might think that this Bible is old-fashioned, <coughs> outdated, needs to be brought up to speed. The reality is this is the Word of God. 
This is what God has given us. This is how we know who God is and what He desires for our lives. And despite the, the cry for a new morality in our world today, this is where you and I should find the morality that we live by. There is a reason that suicide rates are highest among people who live as there are no consequences to life. They feel they have no reason to live, so they take their own lives. This world is broken, covered in deep darkness, but there is hope. There are pinpoints of light, L-I-G-H-T, light, which break through this darkness. And those pinpoints of light are Christians. And Jesus has told you and I that we are the light of the world. And wherever we go, the light of Christ goes with us. And all Christians bear this light. Some bear it with a, a boldness and a brightness that wherever they go, it is seen. Some bear it as if it's just a match about to go out. And it's, but it's still a light. And it could be flared into a good thing at any moment. But we are the light of Christ. We bring it. And it needs to be shined forth through your life and mine. <clears throat> we have the answer all men seek. And his name is Jesus. Let's pray.